Number one. The family of a 16 years old who went missing in 2019 is continuing to hold out hope for her safe return. Amaria Hall vanished from Trenton, Michigan, about 30 minutes south of Detroit, sometime on July 7 when her family was sleeping. The teen suffered from several health issues including asthma, diseases in her blood and bones, as well as depression and severe anxiety. These ailments caused Amaria to miss school for lengthy periods of time, so she turned to online classes to catch up after falling behind. The day before she went missing, Amaria Hall was spending a significant amount of time on the internet. She reportedly asked her mother for an adapter for the computer and later complained that the Wi-Fi wasn't working. There weren't any problems at home to suggest that the teen was planning to leave or was growing despondent, however, upon realizing that Amaria was gone, her family reportedly found a note. It was allegedly from Amaria and it stated that she was leaving and she didn't want anyone to go looking for her in her absence because it could make things worse for her. She is said to have packed a bag and left her medications behind. Around 3 a.m. That morning, Amaria's mother April Hall said she believed she heard someone open the sliding glass door. Hours later, April got up to get ready for church, but when she checked in on Amaria, she was gone. These last moments have caused April to believe that there was someone her daughter was communicating with online that may have lured her into a dangerous situation. There is a fear that the teen was being groomed and coaxed to separate from her family. I'm not going to stop looking for my daughter, said April. I would give my life for my daughter. Further fueling this theory are reports that prior to Amaria's disappearance, the teen received a package in the mail from a man she met online, reportedly in his 40s. Also, almost a month after Amaria Hall vanished, her family reportedly received a phone call. Amaria was spotted within the first four days in Westland, a Thursday night, said April. In the phone call, April recalled her daughter saying she could come home if we said this person didn't take her. However, the call abruptly ended and no one has heard from Amaria since. However, there have been hundreds of leads given to and followed up by police, but nothing has been the information they need to bring Amaria Hall home. The alleged sightings of Amaria have been plentiful, yet, not fruitful. I don't know who she was talking to online, I do know one person was a male, probably can't say his name, and that person gave a lead way out of state, then he gave another lead, so we think that person may have something to do with it, April told reporters of this mysterious person she considers a suspect. Amaria is described as a vibrant young lady who acted a bit younger than her age. She reportedly had dreams of one day becoming a social worker, and despite her health setbacks, Amaria was active in swimming and volleyball. Just know that we're still looking for you, and my love will never end, said April in a message that she hopes will reach her daughter. She pleaded with whoever Amaria may be with to drop her off at a hospital. Somebody always knows something, said community activist Malik Shabazz. Detroit Police Department is on it, the FBI is on it. Westland and Trenton, but we need the public. We need the public to speak up. A $10,000 reward is reportedly being offered in this case. If it leads to an arrest, not a conviction, an arrest, then you get the reward, cash. At the time of her disappearance, Amaria Hall stood 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighed 150 pounds. She had black slash dark brown hair and brown eyes. Her ears and her nose are pierced, and she wore braces. Amaria's conditions cause her to require the use of medications that she did not have when she left home. She would be 18 years old at the time of this publication. Anyone with information about this case is urged to contact the Trenton Police Department at 734-676-3737, Crime Stoppers at 1-800-SPEAK-UP, Anonymous, or their local authorities. The agency case number is 2019-07595. Number 2. Sixteen years old Aranda Briones has been missing since January 13, 2019. The teen left her Moreno Valley, California home that day, after telling her family that she was going to spend the day with a male friend from school. Aranda never returned home that evening and has not been seen or heard from again. The male friend, who was later identified as 18 years old Owen Shover, stated that he dropped Aranda off at Moreno Valley Community Park, 
between 6 and 6.30 p.m. However, investigators looked at footage of the park, and Aranda was not seen at any point that day. Additionally, the male friend said that he saw Aranda get into a four-door gray sedan. Aranda's family reportedly does not know anybody with a car of that description, and said car was not seen on the park surveillance footage either. Two brothers have been charged in connection with murder of a 16-years-old girl who went missing in Southern California last month. Owen Shover, 18, and Gary Shover, 21, were charged on Friday in relation to the murder of Aranda Briones of Moreno Valley, who has not been seen since Jan. 13, according to the Riverside County Sheriff's Office. Briones' last known location was at a community park in Moreno Valley, where friends said she had been dropped off that evening. Her family reported her missing the next day. The brothers were taken into custody on Tuesday, with Owen Shover charged with murder and his brother charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Briones' body has yet to be found. According to the Riverside County Sheriff's Office, Briones and Owen Shover were childhood friends who had recently reconnected. The Sheriff's Office said the Shovers were suspects early in the investigation and that Briones' family had pointed them in their direction. She did have a bad choice of friends, I'll be honest, you know everybody does, Briones' uncle, Matthew Horstcott, told us last month. Everybody makes mistakes, but you know one thing I want? I just want her home safe. Owen Shover, who was the person last seen with Briones, told sheriffs that he dropped her off at a park on Jan. 13 and had not seen her since. We destroyed the timeline of events that he gave us, Riverside County Sheriff's Deputy Michael Vasquez said, and replaced it with what we knew to be true based on video surveillance footage. The sheriff's office expanded the investigation, and began to cooperate with the FBI and the homicide unit on Jan. 20. On February. 11, authorities served a search warrant at the home of Owen and Gary Shover in Hesperia, California, about 40 minutes from Moreno Valley, and arrested the brothers. The sheriff's office said evidence was collected at their residence, but did not specify what was found. The investigation is still active, and the sheriff's office is still seeking the public's help to locate Briones. We still don't have a body, said Vasquez. We still don't know where she is. The brothers are being held without bail and will make their next court appearance on March 1. At this time, investigators have not released a motive and Aranda's body has still not been found. The FBI has made it clear that the investigation is still ongoing and they are still encouraging anybody with information to contact them. Number 3. Dulce Alvarez vanished from a playground in Bridgeton, New Jersey, on September 16, 2019. The five years old little girl was spending the day with her mother and siblings. In the image below, Dulce is seen inside a local ice cream shop. Her mother bought Dulce and her siblings ice cream before stopping by the park where she was last seen. Once at the park, Dulce and her three year old brother went to play on the swings while their mother waited in the car with their eight-year-old sister. A short time later, the three-year-old boy returned to the car in tears, saying that he could not find Dulce. After briefly searching the park, their mother called 911 to report Dulce missing. Many of these businesses have posted flyers of five-year-old Dulce Maria Alaves, who went missing there in September 2019. Investigators are holding out hope that the child is still alive, and that a sports program they introduced after her disappearance will help foster trust between police and the largely Spanish-speaking immigrant community. It's been really hard for me and for my parents knowing that Dulce doesn't appear, Perez, told us. Nobody knows where she is. She was a sweet girl. Nice, loving, Perez said. She likes to pretend that she was always a princess. She likes to be around like smaller kids. She always liked to give hugs and kisses. There isn't a day she doesn't think about her daughter. I would say to her that, I'm sorry for not looking over her, she said tearfully. After her disappearance, the city's police athletic league launched indoor soccer to help build the relationship between community and police. Bridgeton police officer Josh Thompson, the director of police athletic league and 25-year veteran, said the department doesn't want people to feel scared if they have concerns about their legal status and withhold information that could delay finding Dulce. What we really wanted to do was really go out and extend our hand to let you know that we were really behind you. 
So we offered up some more programs, Thompson said. More than 40 boys and girls regularly attend the soccer practices. The program also offers counseling sessions, GED instruction, and nutrition classes for parents. I play soccer here, and it was always like a dream to me to play soccer with a team, 11-year-old Derrickson told us. Dulce's disappearance is still on everyone's mind. With the disappearance of Dulce Alvarez, this helped our community to be stronger and connect more with the people, 15-year-old Brian said. That's exactly what this program aims to do. You don't have to worry about if you're a citizen, Thompson said. We're focusing on trying to find this young lady, and if you have any information, you don't have to worry about anything. Dulce's family is grateful their little girl hasn't been forgotten. They're not like giving up on her, they keep sharing her posts, she said. And there's even a tree in the park about her so every time kids or adults go there, they see her tree and there's a picture of her there. You have to keep your motor running so you can keep going forward, she added in Spanish. Police then issued an amber alert and asked local residences to be on the lookout for a man who they thought might have taken Dulce away in a van. However, police later announced that the man was just somebody they wished to interview. In October 2019, a sketch was released of the man, who was reportedly seen at the park, with two children under the age of five, around the same time Dulce vanished. Many searches have been conducted in the park and in the surrounding areas, but unfortunately no trace of Dulce has been found. In January 2019, police announced that they have made significant progress in the investigation, but did not elaborate any further. Dulce still remains missing today, and there is a $75,000 reward in place for information that could lead to her return. If you have any information that could help the investigation, please contact the New Jersey State Police Missing Persons Unit at 609-882-2000, EXT. 2554, or the Bridgeton Police, at 856451033. Number 4. Elizabeth Breck vanished from the Sierra Tucson Rehabilitation Center in Tucson, Arizona, on January 13, 2019. The 46 years old checked into the facility three days earlier to complete a 30-day treatment for trauma. After being evaluated by the staff, it was determined that Elizabeth was not a threat to herself or others. As a result, she was admitted to the general living quarters, an area in the facility that is not locked down. Just hours later, Elizabeth vanished. She has never been seen or heard from again. Elizabeth was reportedly seen for the last time around 3 p.m. At some point later that afternoon, staff discovered that she was missing. Elizabeth's medical bracelet and personal belongings were found in her assigned room. The only items missing were her ID card and some cash. Elizabeth's car remained in the facility's parking lot. However, Elizabeth herself was nowhere to be found. Since her disappearance, there has not been any activity on Elizabeth's credit cards. She also has not been in contact with any family members, including her two daughters, which is uncharacteristic of her. The rehabilitation facility reportedly told local investigators that Elizabeth left the building on her own volition and was not in crisis at the time of her disappearance. However, her family disagrees. Elizabeth's parents believe she was having a mental breakdown that played a role in her disappearance from the facility. The family has since filed a complaint against the facility. Her parents also claim that the facility has not provided any information about their daughter's disappearance and there is reportedly no known surveillance footage of Elizabeth exiting the building. It's tough. It's been a year, said Christopher Breck, Elizabeth's brother. She wasn't at Christmas this year and Thanksgiving. Big family holidays are probably the hardest. Breck would now be 48 years old. Her family says she loved Catalina State Park, and they believe she may have tried to walk there on foot from the facility. It was rainy that evening, it dropped down very, very cold, Christopher Breck said. Who knows I just hope nobody took her and did something to her. I would rather have her succumb to the elements than have something like that happen. Investigators working Breck's case are calling it a mystery, wondering why or how a beloved Tucson high school teacher and mother of two could just disappear. The strangest thing to me is that there is nothing, said George Economides, a private investigator with Patriot Shield Investigations said. I mean like she literally just vanished. 
Breck's family believes she may had a breakdown, causing her to flee the facility with only her ID and some cash. We had a number of calls from the time she went missing to mid-July of possible sightings, Economida said. Followed up on all those with no positive result. They were always explained off as somebody else, or somebody that looked like Elizabeth. Elizabeth's family members hired private investigators to help search for Elizabeth. A five-mile radius around the facility was thoroughly searched, but unfortunately nothing was found. The private investigators also received a few reported sightings, but none of them have panned out. Since then, very few clues have turned up. Elizabeth's family members have set up a GoFundMe page to help them continue to pay for their private investigator. If you'd like to donate, please go here. If you have any information that could lead to her whereabouts, please call 520-882-7463 to submit an anonymous tip. Number 5 Graciela Garcia has been missing since November 2019. The 49-years-old woman was last seen in Hermiston, Oregon. On the evening of November 8, 2019, Graciela had dinner plans with her 14-years-old son, who was staying at his father's home. Graciela's son was surprised when his stepfather, Graciela's husband, showed up with food instead. Graciela's husband explained that she had already gone to bed. Graciela was never seen or heard from again. Nearly four months later, Graciela's family continues to search for her and believes that she is still alive, but fears she is in trouble. I just feel that she's still here, Graciela's youngest daughter, Gabby, told us. It's like daughter's intuition maybe, but I still feel her. My sister and brothers do too. We just need to find her soon. Gabby said her teenage brother was worried when their mother never showed up to meet him as planned. Their parents are divorced, and while Gabby and two of her siblings are grown and live on their own, their youngest brother splits his time between his parents' houses in Hermiston, Oregon. Around 7 p.m. that night, Gabby said her brother received a text from their mother. He also had two missed calls from her, but told family when he tried to call her back, his calls went to voicemail. So, he alerted his siblings. That was a huge red flag, Gabby said. She always had her phone on and had been in constant contact with my brother that night. They were supposed to meet. That was the plan. She wouldn't have just turned her phone off and disappeared. Graciela's phone remained off and her social media went quiet. When Gabby and her siblings searched their mother's home on Hurlbert Avenue, her car was still there and everything inside seemed to be in place. That was odd, too, Gabby told us. All her jewelry was there. In one place. Whenever she would go out, she would put on her rings. Things would be scattered, like her clothes, but it was all in place. And nothing was missing. Graciela's family reported her missing on Monday, November 11th. The Hermiston Police Department began their investigation that day. Detectives are treating Graciela's disappearance as suspicious, Hermiston Police Chief Jason Edmiston told us. We are actively investigating this case, and our investigation unit continues to follow every lead, Chief Edmiston said. He added there are no confirmed details available about exactly where or when Garcia was last seen. Somebody out there saw something, Gabby said. They had to. We just hope someone will come forward and say something. Gabby told us she fears her mother was kidnapped. I don't know who would take her or why, but someone has her, she added. Graciela was a young child when she immigrated to the United States from Mexico and has been living in Oregon since her family settled there. That's where she met her husband who was also originally from Mexico. They raised two daughters and two sons before divorcing after 17 years of marriage. We were very family-oriented when they were together, Gabby said. My mother loved to travel and took us where she could. California. Washington. And even back to Mexico where my father grew up. I think that's why I love to travel so much now. Many of Graciela's travels were for hair shows, which she attended for her job as a hairstylist. She is a well-known, very loved hairstylist in this area, Gabby said. She was always trying to better herself and reach her full potential. And taught us to do the same. Graciela has been in the salon business for at least 14 years and had recently moved her business, Carrie's Beauty Salon, into her home. 
Her clients are like family, Gabby said. This whole community is worried about her. So many people, even strangers, have reached out to us to ask how they can help. Or to just say they're thinking of us. And that means a lot. Gabby and her family are frustrated with the lack of movement in the investigation and hope someone will come forward with information. It's almost been four months now and I'm tired of the silence, Gabby said. This is our mom. Where is she? Gabby told us she can't help but think of the promise she made her mother when she was just 10 years old. She wrote her a letter, promising her that she would always take care of her. My mom loves that letter and cries every time she reads it, Gabby said. She reposts it on Facebook every year. And she makes sure to tell me to not forget that promise, to not forget to take care of her. So I won't forget. I want to be able to keep that promise by bringing her home safely to us. So I can take care of her. The family is asking people to share any information they may have with the Hermiston Police Department. Graciela is described as being 5 feet, 4 inches tall, and weighing 140 pounds. Her hair was blonde when she was last seen. It is unclear if anything was seized during the searches of the home or property. Graciela remains missing without a trace. Her children are desperately searching for answers. If you have any information that could help locate Graciela, please call Hermiston's anonymous tip line at 541-667-5148. Number 6 Jasmine Robinson has been missing since February 18, 2019. That day reportedly began as a regular day for the 23 years old woman, she video chatted with her sister that morning and then went to work as scheduled. Jasmine returned to her Archer, Florida home around 8 p.m. that evening and told her and she was going to bed. When Jasmine's in came by the following morning to take her to a doctor's appointment, Jasmine was not there. She has never been seen or heard from again. Jasmine was six to seven months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. According to Jasmine's sister, Jasmine was upset with the father of her unborn child because he was constantly calling her on her personal number and at her work number. Jasmine reportedly did not want a relationship with this man. Her family members believe that he could be involved in Jasmine's disappearance, but he has not been publicly identified or named as a suspect at this time. She's a very sweet person, Shantavia told a local news station. She never did anything to anybody. We just want Jasmine home, and till this day it's still going to be, bring Jasmine home and the baby. Come home Jazz and Jamilia. Anybody that know anything, please come forth. Detectives have and continue to gather significant technical and forensic evidence, said Lt. Brett Rodenizer, public information officer for the sheriff's office. We also know that there is key information that only certain people can provide, and this unique reward opportunity just may encourage them to do the right thing for Jasmine and her child. We know she left her home in Archer with someone, and there is someone who knows who that is. Jasmine's case was quickly changed to an endangered missing person, but police have yet to name a suspect connected to her disappearance. Investigators have repeatedly attempted to trace her last footsteps, but it hasn't brought them any closer to solving this case. February 19, 2019, was the last time her family members saw her at home, but police believe that she traveled with an unknown person. However, they can't outright call her disappearance a crime because they lack the evidence to support that theory. Whoever saw her last, we need that information because that would give us the key starting point where we can then have the assistance of the public, use the specialized resources that are available to the sheriff's office to get out and begin that very deliberate on the ground search to bring Jasmine home, stated LT. Brett Rodenizer. Investigators attempted to draw a connection between Jasmine's recent run-in with the law and her disappearance, but her family insists the two aren't related. She was arrested for stealing a mobile phone and sending money to herself via a mobile cash app. Prior to going missing, Jasmine Nikeyesha Robinson was looking forward to her change of plea court date. I don't think that court date got anything to do with her going missing because Jasmine was paying her money, Jasmine's and Bertha Williams said. She meant that she did some wrong and she was paying for it. Seeing her probation and paying her money for it. I don't think this has anything to do with her being missing. I think we're wasting time trying to pin that to this situation. 
She added, we just want some answers so she can just come home, and we're looking for her too. At the time of her disappearance, Jasmine Nikeisha Robinson was 5 feet 2 inches tall, and approximately 160 pounds. She had black hair braided shoulder length and brown eyes. She has black framed glasses, and wears a size 8 and 1 half, to 9 women's shoe, or sometimes wears men's boots, which are a size 7 to 7 and 1 half. Detectives have not released many details about evidence they have gathered, but they did state that they believe Jasmine was not alone when she left her home on the night of her disappearance. They are encouraging anyone with information about her disappearance to come forward. There is an $8,000 reward in place for information that could lead to her whereabouts. If you have any information that could help the investigation, please contact the Alachua County Sheriff's Office at 3523674083. Number 7. Jepsi Amaga Kalunji has been missing since March 21, 2019. The 26 years old woman was last seen in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where she lives with her husband Dane Kalunji. Jepsi moved to Colorado from the Philippines in 2017 after meeting Dane online that same year. Jepsi's mother, who is living in Hong Kong, last spoke to Jepsi on March 20. After days passed, without hearing from her daughter, Jepsi's mother reached out to Dane on social media. He replied, saying he has no clue about Jepsi's whereabouts, and he has since deleted his social media accounts. Colorado Springs Police Lt. James Sokolik told us that Dane was arrested Wednesday in Albuquerque, New Mexico, after a warrant was issued for his arrest. Jepsi's family reported her missing on April 4, 2019, after her family and friends hadn't heard from the 26 years old in several weeks. She always talked to me, her mother Margie Amaga told us. She always messaged me, so I wondered at the time why she's not online. Sokolik said investigators were able to determine that no one had spoken or heard from Jepsi after March 20, 2019. They now believe Dane killed his wife and then hid the body. With the evidence right now, it appears there was some sort of domestic disturbance, and at some point, during that time, we believe Dane strangled Jepsi, and then later buried her body in an unknown location, Sokolik said. He declined to provide any details about what led investigators to draw that conclusion, but said authorities had executed about three dozen search warrants during the two-year investigation and conducted multiple interviews that led them to identify Dane as the primary suspect in the slaying. Detectives allegedly recovered numerous items of physical evidence during their searches, according to a press release from the department. Jepsi, who was originally from the Philippines, moved to the United States in 2017 after meeting her future husband online and falling in love with him, her mother said. The couple got married a short time later. Margie told us that Dane told her, after her daughter disappeared, that Jepsi had gone to visit friends, either in the Philippines, Mexico, or Chicago. I just want to know if she's still alive or dead, she told us shortly after her daughter's disappearance. I don't know where she is, why she's gone. Sokolik said the case remains very much an active investigation. We are dedicated to finding answers, to finding exactly what happened, he said. Investigators are still searching for the 26-year-old's remains. This is a horrible thing to have, especially a mother, not know where her daughter is and what's happened to her, Sokolik said. So, what we're hoping is some sort of information that will at least bring, I'll never say closure, because that doesn't happen in this sort of situation, but we could bring some sort of understanding of what happened and hopefully locate Jepsi's body and be able to bring that back for her family. Anyone with information about the case is urged to contact the Colorado Springs Police or Crime Stoppers Tips Hotline if they'd like to remain anonymous. June 17, 2021 According to the Bernalillo County Custody List, Jepsi's husband Dane Kalunji has been arrested and charged with murder in the first degree. There have not been any mainstream media articles his arrest yet, so it has not been confirmed that he has been arrested for Jepsi's murder, though it seems likely that this is the case, rather than a separate murder. However, Jepsi still remains missing. Updates on this case are expected. June 19, 2021 It's been confirmed that Dane Kalunji was, in fact, arrested and charged with Jepsi's murder. He was reportedly arrested while attempting to enter an Air Force base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Throughout the investigation in Jepsi's disappearance, 
authorities reportedly found physical evidence showing that a domestic disturbance occurred where Dane Kalunji strangled Jepsi Kalunji and buried her body in an unknown location. Number 8 Kat Hamanter and her dog Tootsie vanished while hiking near San Felipe in Baja, California, Mexico on April 11, 2019. The 68 years old woman is originally from Seattle, Washington, but on the day she vanished, she was visiting the California Mexico border for a hiking trip with her husband, daughter, and a group of other hikers. According to the group she was with, Kat hurt her foot or ankle about 10 minutes into the hike. She told the other hikers that she was going to wait for them to come back from their hike which was supposed to be relatively short. However, when the group returned from their hike, both Kat and her dog Tootsie were nowhere to be found. Kat's husband, Warren Sunfist, told police that he waited for Kat at their car, but she never returned. She has not been seen or heard from again. The hike was somewhat derailed when, only 10 minutes into their trek, Kat twisted her ankle and was unable to continue. It wasn't noticeably a very serious injury, but she could walk no further and it took the wind out of her sails, with her telling the others that she would just have a seat and wait there with her dog for the others to come back. They weren't planning to be gone too long, Kat was described as being in good spirits and not showing any undue duress, sitting happily upon a boulder near a creek and shooing them off, so the rest of the hikers had no reason to think that there was anything to worry about. However, when they returned from their quick hike to a nearby waterfall some 90 minutes later, neither Kat nor her dog were anywhere to be seen. The group fanned out and called her name, as well as the dog's name, but there was no response, and it was as if she had never been there at all. Not only was she gone, but there was no evidence of any sort of struggle, no signs of a wild animal attack, she and her dog had seemingly just vanished into thin air. Kat's husband, Warren Sunquist, waited at the car until evening, hoping that she had just wandered off to explore, even though he realized that this was unlikely due to the fact that she had been hobbling about on her injured ankle. Authorities would then be notified, and a search organized, including local search and rescue crews, tracker dogs, and Mexican military helicopters, but nothing at all was found of either her or her dog. Some strange details were that the tracker dogs were apparently unable to pick up a clear trail, and Tootsie was said to be quite a yappy dog, but there was no barking. It was also especially odd considering that she was described as a smoker and had a lighter with her, so she could have easily made a signal fire for searchers to home in on, but there was never anything of the sort. How could this woman and her dog both so fully disappear, especially when she could barely walk? It remains a mystery, but there are some theories. One idea is that she may have come across illicit marijuana growers or drug runners and been silenced. Indeed, the search for her had uncovered several fields of marijuana, so had she perhaps just come across the wrong people at the wrong time? Considering there was no sign of foul play it is hard to say. The idea of an animal attack was also considered, but again, these sorts of attacks are typically messy affairs that would have left behind blood and torn clothing, but nothing of the sort was found, nor were any animal tracks. The site was completely pristine. Police at one point suspected that someone in the group she had been with had perhaps had something to do with it, but everyone who had been with her was comprehensively questioned and police came away satisfied that none of them had had anything to do with it. It was thought that she may have gotten lost, but her husband refuted this, claiming that she could barely walk at the time and that he suspected her foot had been broken. There were also no signs of any other vehicles in the vicinity, indeed the nearest road was some miles away, so it seemed unlikely she could have been picked up or abducted by someone in a car or truck. Although Kat's residence was in Seattle at the time of her disappearance, she had previously lived near the area where she disappeared in Mexico for about 20 years. Since she was familiar with the area, her friends and family believed she was comfortable waiting by herself while the group finished their hike. Kat was reportedly not showing any signs of extreme physical distress either. After she was discovered missing, local search and rescue crews and Mexican military helicopters searched for Kat and Tootsie, but unfortunately no trace of them has been found. The group of people Kat was with has been questioned, but it is unclear if police believe that they had anything to do with her disappearance. What happened to Kat Hammonder? It is unlikely we will ever know for sure. Kat and Tootsie remain missing today. If you have any information about their whereabouts, please contact authorities at 619-216-4000.